So lesson nine, redox processes. Today we're gonna to look at the electrolysis of sodium chloride and copper sulfates. These two correspond and contribute to the selective discharge that we talked about last lesson in lesson eight. Lesson eight, we looked at electrolysis of water as an example of selective discharge with respect to standard electrode potential values of ions. Today, sodium chloride and copper sulfates are on concentration and nature of electrode. From last time, we looked at molten sodium chloride electrolyte with respect to water. Today, we're gonna to look at selective discharge on the relative concentrations of the ions in the electrolyte and the nature of the electrode. Remember, the standard electrode values of the ions was the factor we investigated with the electrolysis of water. The relative concentration of the ions in the electrolyte, we're gonna look at sodium chloride um, as an example. So the electrolysis of sodium chloride, aqueous sodium chloride can also be known as brine solution. It's similar steps as before. So where we have the ions, right? So the electrolyte, sodium chloride, um, dissociates into sodium, ions and chloride ions. Sodium ions are cations. Remember in electrolysis, cat ions go to cathode. The anions go to anode. So the chloride ions go to the anode. So now we can write out our cathode and anode. Remember in electrolysis, we also have to take into account of cathode and anode um, with respect to water because they are aqueous solutions. So here we have comparisons of sodium and water reductions, and we have water and chloride ions oxidation. So looking at these, which ones do you guys think um, is going to occur at the cathode and which one is going to occur at the anode? So give it a second to think about it. Remember how we talked about this in class, that the standard electric potentials in your data booklet, table 24, goes from negative um, to positive, right? Where negative on top um, is where oxidation usually occurs. And um, as we go down the reactivity series, so does um, reduction increase. So cathode is reduction, anode is oxidation. Cathode reduction um, is near the bottom of the reactivity series, which becomes more positive. So in this case, comparing sodium and water, we would have to give water um, the chance to approach the cathode. Um, in terms of the anode, remember, anode here, again, in front of the standard electric potential E, there's a negative sign. The reason why they are negative now multiplied by negative one is because all of our standard electric potentials are in the reduction formation, right? In our data booklet 24. So in order to make oxidation, we have to flip it. So when we flip it, we have to multiply it by negative one. So before flipping it, we know the oxidation occurs up top. So that's where it's more negative. Um, so now that we multiplied a negative one in front of the more negative number, then we know in this case, water again occurs at the anode. So now the overall equation, we would have to give it both to anode and cathode in terms of water being oxidized and water being reduced. But the problem is, um, recall selective discharge. If we have a higher concentration of chloride ions, then instead it causes the chloride ions to be preferentially oxidized, which then discharges chlorine instead of oxygen from the anode. So instead of, um, the oxidation of water at the anode, we now have a preferential oxidation of chloride ions by discharging chlorine. So in this case then, the cathode um, still stays the same, but the anode now is the oxidation of chloride ions. So the overall equation with discharge of chlorine then becomes cathode, anode. Remember, this happens to be balanced in terms of the electrons, so we could cross them out easily. 
we can write an overall balanced equation as such. And then with respect to that, we can add our standard electrode potentials together to calculate the cell potential, which is negative 2.19 volts. So now looking at the reaction prediction. Assuming that chloride ions are discharged, then we know that gases evolve both at anode and cathode. Anode, chlorine, um, and that gives us a very strong set. The release of hydroxide ions um, also means that there's an increase in the pH of the electrolyte, right? Therefore, the selective discharge of the ion, we can see here, depends on the ion concentration. Again, we know that the pH increases in the electrolyte because if you take a look at the cathode, there's an, a release of hydroxide ions, okay? So that's where we know that there is an increase in pH as opposed to a decrease in pH. If it was a decrease in pH, then what would the electrolyte contain? Think about this. Good. So it would contain hydrogen ions, right, and not hydroxide ions. Again, this refers back to acidic and basic conditions as well. So now looking at the application of sodium chloride electrolysis, this produces hydrogen gas, chlorine gas, sodium ions, and hydroxide ions, right? So in this case, actually, electrolysis for sodium chloride, we have sodium hydroxide, chlorine, and hydrogen. Um, chlorine and hydrogen gas, all of these are very important in the production of various things. An example is the coating on your pretzel, okay? Another is the production of plastic. And lastly, um, oh, the photo's not showing, but lastly, um, it can also produce paper. So when you produce paper, wood pulp, you need to bleach your paper to make it look white. And that's where a lot of these components come in. So by using electrolysis, we're able to separate these um, compounds into their simpler elements, for which would be very hard for us to separate otherwise. Now let's look at selective discharge again. We're going to look at a second example, well, the third one here, which is the nature of the electrode. So now here's a question for you guys. The electrolysis of copper sulfates with inert electrodes Everything that we've been doing so far in terms of electrolysis has been using inert electrodes. So copper sulfate, try this one with carbon or other inert electrodes and predict the reaction outcome at the two electrodes. So kind of like what we did with the electrolysis of water and the electrolysis of um, sodium chloride, figure out what would happen to the electrolysis of copper sulfate. So everything we have done until now looks at inert electrodes. So now we're going to look at another one. The question that you just did looked at inert electrodes, but the last factor in terms of selective, selective discharge looks at the nature of the electrodes, right? So the first one that you did in terms of the question is inert electrode. Right now we're going to look at copper sulfate with copper electrode. So we're not using inert or carbon graphite electrodes. We're using copper electrodes for copper sulfate. So at the cathode now, we have copper being reduced. Here we have the anode of, again, water um, producing oxygen, and we have the oxidation of copper. Here, when we use copper electrodes, instead of the water being oxidized, now it's the copper being oxidized. That's going to give us a net movement of electrons from the anode to the cathode again stays the same. We see the net movement of copper 2 plus though from anode to cathode. So do you see how copper 2 plus is used in both the anode and the cathode? Now this gets really interesting. So looking at the question that you answered, you should be able to see that in the previous prediction with inert electrodes, there was a pink and brown color of copper deposited on the cathode colorless oxygen that's evolved at the anode because the water was being oxidized, there was a pH decrease because of the release of hydrogen ions, 
and then there was a loss of blue color due to copper 2 plus discharge. Now look at this one for the copper electrodes. We still have pink brown color of the copper deposited on the cathode. However, now there's a disintegration of copper at the anode. There's no change to the pH of the solution because it's just the net electron movement and the copper 2 plus movement. And so there's no loss of blue color of copper 2 plus. So application of copper electrodes, the application here is essentially purification. This is also known as, so we see the purification of copper um, because we use copper electrodes. So starting off at the anode, we started off with an impure copper anode. This oxidation releases the copper 2 plus and the two electrons, which then moves from the anode to the cathode and deposits onto the pure copper cathode, um, copper 2 plus ions, and the electrons forming copper solid. So here we get to see an impure copper anode and a purification of copper through the transfer of electrons and the copper 2 plus ions from the anode to the cathode.